Hi, my name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesia resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. In this video, I'm going to be showing you all of the medications that I use for two spinal surgeries and keeping track of exactly how much all of it costs. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribed to the channel. Let's dive in. One of the things that as a resident I'm encouraged to think about as I'm learning anesthesiology is exactly how much money I'm spending as I provide my anesthetic. And so today I'm taking care of two different patients who are both getting almost exactly the same type of spine surgery. And so I'm trying a couple of different types of anesthetic techniques. And in addition to comparing how the patients do and how well their pain is controlled after surgery, I thought it would also be really interesting to compare how much money I'm spending in terms of the medications that I use for both of these surgeries. This is pretty much an opportunity to do a back-to-back -back comparison of cost. <laughs> Get it? Back-to-back. -back. Spine surgery. Yeah. I'm just about to start preparing the operating room for the day and what I'm going to do is highlight each one of the medications that I'm drawing up for this case and then I'll actually save all of the empty medication vials and bags that I use during the cases and tally them up afterwards and come up with a cost for each one of these anesthetics. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going through my MS Maids mnemonic right now, and if you want to see a full video on that, you can check that out right here. And now I'm at the drugs part of the mnemonic, and so the first thing that I'm going to do is wash my hands, and I put on a pair of gloves, and now I'm going to go ahead and get out all of the syringes that I'm going to use, and I'll label them before I draw anything up, and I do that for safety. One of the things that helps me conceptualize the induction medications is to just think about the order in which I'm going to be administering everything. So starting from the time that we roll into the operating room, get the patient connected to monitors, and then start administering medications, the first thing is going to be midazolam. And then once I start pre-oxygenating the patient, I'll go ahead and administer a little bit of fentanyl. Next will be 2% lidocaine to help reduce the amount of stinging when the propofol is injected next. And we actually have lidocaine that's in pre-drawn syringes now. Next up is propofol. And for induction, I'll be using this 20 cc vial. Only after general anesthesia has been induced, I will go ahead and administer a depolarizing paralytic succinylcholine. And the reason that I'm not going to plan on keeping the patient paralyzed throughout the duration of the case is because there will be neural monitoring to assess for any sort of changes in somatosensory evoked potentials or motor evoked potentials. So I can't have the patient paralyzed for that. However, I will need the patient paralyzed in order to have ideal intubating conditions. And so I'll do that with the short acting paralytic succinylcholine. Having said that, I will plan on having a small dose of non-depolarizing, slightly longer acting paralytic rocuronium, which can facilitate an exposure as the surgeon gets to the exact operative area. I don't plan on this dose lasting for very long, so I'll just draw up a small amount of rocuronium. As part of pain control for this case, I'm actually going to be using a medication called methadone, which you might traditionally think of being used for outpatient management of substance abuse, but it can actually be a really helpful medication for managing painful surgeries. And I get it directly from the pharmacy in a vial that looks just like this. You could check out a link in the description below for an excellent review article highlighting the ways in which a relatively low dose of methadone is safe and effective for analgesia for a lot of different types of surgery. The last medication that I use as part of my induction plan is dexamethasone, which is actually just for anti-emesis and is most effective when given at the beginning of the case. 
Now that I've drawn up all of the medications that I'll use for induction of anesthesia, I'm going to plan on keeping track of everything that I use for maintenance and emergence so that at the end of the day, we can sit down and tally up the cost of all of these medications. Now I'm gonna finish setting up the room, I'll go meet the patient and we'll get the case started. And to protect patient privacy, of course, I'm gonna be turning off the camera, so I'll catch up with you a little bit later. All right, I'm just sitting down for a lunch break now with some really gourmet looking French fries and lentil soup. And this doesn't contribute anything substantive to a video about medication costs, but it's really just more of a public service announcement regarding anesthesiology and the fact that we prioritize normal human behavior like eating lunch in the middle of the day. And I'll point out that anesthesiology is one of the few specialties that goes out of their way to make sure that we actually get to eat throughout the course of the day. Cheers to anesthesiology. The first surgery has now ended and here's everything I used for maintenance, which includes three 100cc bottles of propofol, three 2cc vials of fentanyl, one bag of 1,000 milligrams of tranexamic acid, four grams of the antibiotic cefazolin, and four milligrams of ondansetron, also known as Zofran. Now I've got a very short period of time to get everything set up for the next case, and these are the induction medications that we'll use for the second case, and I did find myself with a little bit of extra time to play with this super fancy microscope. Well, that was fun. Let's go ahead and start the second surgery. I will just say that no matter how much I love my job, which I really do, I think anesthesiology is wonderful. It is difficult to be inside a windowless room when it's so beautiful outside. But on the bright side, I did get a new pair of shoes recently, which I think are really awesome. Anyways, the afternoon break is over. Time to get back to the OR. I've got all the empty vials from the case, so we'll go ahead and count them right now. And also, as you can see, I've got more facial hair than the last time that I pulled out my phone because this has been quite a long case. It's pretty late in the evening right now, so this will actually end up being a pretty substantial tally of medications reflecting just how long and complex the case was that we just finished. Ta-da! Just about everything from the case except for a couple bags of isolite that left with the patient for packing. Okay, ready to tally the maintenance and emergence from the case. So maintenance included one, two, three, four P100s, as we say, which would be 100 cc vials of propofol. Additionally, three P20s or 20 cc vials of propofol. Another component of the maintenance anesthetic for this case was Remy Fentanyl, which comes in one milligram vials that look just like this. And get ready to tally, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven milligrams of Remy Fentanyl. Oh, missed one, this is eight. Also part of the maintenance, so to speak, were doses of tranexamic acid. We have two doses. And there were also two doses of Capsol. Each dose was two grams. And I also ended up giving three liters of Isolite, but two of those three ended up going with the patient to pack you. And then as the case was coming to a close, because Remy Fentanyl is such a short acting opioid, I gave a longer acting opioid to help with post-operative pain management, which is hydromorphone, also known as Dilaudid. Then the last medication that I gave on the way out was Ondansetron, also known as Zofran, which is an anti-emetic that's best given approximately a half an hour before emergence from anesthesia. And that is everything I gave for a long and pretty complex spine surgery, but I'm happy to say the patient is awake, comfortable, and sipping on some water in the recovery room. Test, test. 
test, test. So even though it's late right now, I'm actually on overnight call and we don't have any cases going. So I'm gonna use this opportunity to actually go ahead and go through the prices for everything that I've used today for the two spine surgeries that I just provided anesthesia for. Before we start, I do just wanna point out that the prices I'm referencing are not actually from Mount Sinai Hospital, but rather from up to date. And these prices are what are called the average wholesale price, which are to be used just for reference for approximately how much these medications may cost. So keep in mind that the prices that we use here at Mount Sinai or that you may use at your hospital may differ from what's listed on up to date. So to start with the first case and beginning with the induction medications, we had one vial of midazolam, which is a two cc vial, at a cost of $1.80. Next is fentanyl, and we used two vials that are each two cc's, and those cost $2.02 .02 per each vial, so this is a total of $4.04 .04 of fentanyl. Next is lidocaine, we used one syringe, and the syringe, according to UpToDate, is $2.50. Next is a 20 cc vial of propofol, also affectionately referred to as a P20, that costs approximately $6.20. Next up was one vial of the paralytic agent succinylcholine, which costs approximately $24. Next, I drew up one vial of rocuronium that was five cc's, which costs approximately $11.40. I will say that the surgeon elected not to have rocuronium administered to assist with the exposure for this case. So this actually ended up not being used. And this next medication isn't really an induction medication per se, but is typically given at the beginning of cases, which is dexamethasone. And I used two vials that were one cc each for a total cost of $8.16. Okay, now for the maintenance and emergence medications used in the rest of the case, we used P100s, which are the 100 cc vials of propofol, and we used three of those at a cost of $30 each. So that's $90 worth of propofol for maintenance. We also used, at the very beginning of this case, methadone for long-acting pain control, and a 1 cc syringe or 10 milligrams of methadone was $22. We also used three additional vials of fentanyl that were 2 cc's each for an additional cost of $6.06. .06. Other medications that were given throughout the course of the case included tranexamic acid. We gave one bag, which cost $4.57 and then we gave four grams of cefazolin throughout the course of the case, with each gram costing $3.28 for a total of $13.12 of cefazolin. And then to help prevent post-operative nausea and vomiting, at the end of the case, I administered a two cc or four milligram dose of ondansetron, also known as Zofran, which costs approximately $1.62. This brings our total anesthetic cost for this case to $215.47. Okay, for the second case that I did today, we actually started with exactly the same induction strategy, except I did not draw up any rocuronium. So we can copy and paste all of the induction medications and those costs. And then moving along to the maintenance of anesthesia, this case was actually quite a bit longer. And for reasons that pertain to the patient, there was actually quite a bit more medication administered per hour as compared to the first case. So going through this piece by piece, for the maintenance of the second case, I used three P20s for a total cost of $18.60. And then I used four P100s for a total cost of $120. And then I also used for this case a medication called Remifentanil, which is a very short-acting, potent opioid that is particularly useful for certain types of surgeries, including certain types of spine cases. Remifentanil can be a very expensive medication, but it also might not be, depending on the billing circumstances of the hospital. But just going by what's on up to date, a one milligram vial of Remifentanil costs $73.55, and for this case, I used eight of them. And so at that price, it would be $588.40 worth of Remifentanil. The other medications that were administered throughout the course of the case include 
Isolite, and I used two one-liter bags for a cost of $20. And then I also administered four grams of Cefazolin for a total cost of $13.12. And then an additional two bags of tranexamic acid for a total cost of $9.14. And then at the end of the case, I wanted to provide a longer acting analgesic, so I administered one milligram of hydromorphone for a cost of $3.58, as well as one vial of ondansetron, which was $1.62. This brings the theoretical total cost of this case to $821.16. Overall, the amount of money that I theoretically spent to provide anesthesia for approximately 14 hours worth of spine surgery was $1,036.63. When talking about medications and different ones that can be used to provide anesthesia, it's really important to consider that a lot of different anesthetic plans can often be used to accomplish the same purpose, which is keeping the patient safe and comfortable during and after surgery. When you're a junior resident just getting started, your attending anesthesiologist will probably pick out several different strategies for providing anesthesia for similar types of surgeries, which can be very eye-opening in terms of seeing how many different ways you can provide anesthesia. And then as you progress through residency and you gain knowledge of all of the different types of medications that can be used, you can actually propose your own anesthetic plans and as long as your attending deems those to be safe, then you can try those out during residency. So by the time you graduate residency, you'll have a very good understanding of the broad range of pharmacologic agents that are available to us to safely get patients through surgery and have them be comfortable once they're all done. If you like this video, you might also want to check out this video where Dr. Erica Fagelman narrates all of the different medications that are kept inside the anesthesia cart inside the operating room. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Boys.